Welcome to the first presentation of the Collaborative Core Center for Clinical Research Speaker Series. We appreciate you joining us for today's talk. These presentations highlight methodological work being done by researchers across eight of the NIAIM's funded P30 Core Centers for Clinical Research with application to rheumatic and musculoskeletal skeletal conditions. Our present presenter today is Dr. Jamie Collins, an assistant professor of orthopedic surgery at Brigham and Women's Hospital at Harvard Medical School. Her presentation today is titled Statistical Methods to Machine Learning, Methods for Learning from Data. Dr. Collins, whenever you're ready to start, feel free. Great, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. <laughs> Great, well thanks so much for the opportunity to talk today. It's fun getting to see everybody's um, names as they signed in. I see a lot of familiar names, I guess not faces. Um, so many people that I missed at the ORSI meeting and will miss at the ACR meeting this fall. So um, good to see you, sort of. Um, so as Council said, today I will be talking about traditional statistical methods to machine learning, methods for learning from data. So just as an outline, um, I'm going to just go through a quick overview, review some terminology, um, talk a little bit about machine learning versus traditional statistical modeling, and then I want to spend the bulk of the time kind of walking through some examples of how and why we might move from a more sort of straightforward traditional statistical model to a more complex machine learning um, algorithm. So what is the difference between machine learning and statistical modeling? Um, and I like this answer from Dr. Larry Wasserman, who is at Carnegie Mellon. Um, the short answer is none. They're both concerned with the same question. How do we learn from data? Um, so I don't want to spend a lot of time today sort of debating what counts as statistics and what counts as machine learning, but rather again talk about how and why we might move from sort of less complex modeling to more complex uh, modeling and what the advantages and disadvantages are along the way. Um, so what is machine learning? Um, it's a method of data analysis that automates analytical model building. It's the process of teaching a computer system how to make accurate predictions when fed data. Um, it gives computers the capability to learn without being explicitly programmed. So this includes supervised methods, um, unsupervised methods, and semi-supervised methods. So for most of today, I'm going to focus on supervised methods, but just wanted to go through kind of these three groups. So supervised methods are when we have labeled outcomes or classes, and the goal is usually prediction or classification. Um, the focus may be on finding the best prediction algorithm, or it may be on um, determining which variables or features are most closely associated with outcome. So from a traditional statistical model, you could think of linear regression or logistic regression as sort of a supervised method from the more kind of machine learning universe, something like a random forest or a support vector machine. Um, unsupervised methods is when there are no labels or annotations, and the goal is to uncover hidden structure or patterns in the data set. So examples from the more kind of traditional statistical methods, something like principal components or k-means clustering. We get more into the machine learning world when we talk about things like model-based cluster analysis or distance-weighted discrimination. And finally, there are these semi-supervised methods, which are a combination of the supervised and unsupervised approaches. Um, so the outcomes and classes are labeled for some part of the data set, and the analysis is usually done in steps. So with supervised followed by unsupervised or vice versa. So this is a diagram that sort of shows the overlap between computer science, statistics, and domain expertise. If you do a Google image search, there are lots of them that look sort of like this with sort of machine learning thought to be the overlap between computer science and math and statistics. With traditional data analysis, the overlap between math and statistics and kind of domain expertise. I think most people would agree that it's a little bit more nuanced than this. So again, we'll kind of talk about how we move from the domain expertise, math, stat world over toward computer science. So there was a recent perspectives piece in Nature Review's Rheumatology on machine learning based prediction models for osteoarthritis. I thought this was really well done and clear. Um, 
And what this figure is showing is how we would build, train, and validate a prediction model. And I think the thing to emphasize here is that you know, the analytic steps are the same, whether we're using kind of a more traditional statistical model or um, a machine learning approach. So we would have our input data, um, we do any kind of data cleaning or pre-processing, and then we would build our model or sort of train our model. And whether the model is considered kind of more machine learning or statistical modeling really depends on which feature selection and prediction model we use. So feature selection is how we decide which variables to include in the model. And then the learning algorithm is how we model our predictors to our outcome. So whether you're using um, a more complex method, um, such as like gradient boosting and decision trees, or whether you have you know, three variables you want to put in a logistic regression model, the steps that we would think about taking to train, test, and validate that model are, are really the same. Um, so I think the figure just underscores, you know, whether you want to call it machine learning or statistical modeling, we're really talking about the same model building steps. So for the rest of the talk, I want to walk through how and why we might move from a more basic statistical model to a more complex machine learning algorithm. And we can start with a really simple kind of two by two table um, where we would have a dichotomous exposure and a dichotomous outcome. Um, in the machine learning world, this is sometimes referred to as a confusion matrix. Um, I've always called it like a two by two table or a contingency table. Um, but I'll go through this a little bit quickly because it's kind of standard epi stuff. But from our two by two table, we can assess um, the risk of the outcome. So we could calculate the risk in the exposed, the risk in the unexposed, and calculate a risk ratio. We could do the same um, with the odds, calculate the odds in the unexposed, the odds in the exposed, and calculate an odds ratio. Um, we could calculate the agreement or the accuracy. Um, this would be used more in a like, diagnostic study, but here it would be the number that are exposed and have the outcome or that are unexposed and do not have the outcome out of the total. And we can calculate sensitivity and specificity. So for a quick example, we could think of a study where osteoarthritis disease progression is our outcome and prior knee injury is our exposure. So in this sort of toy example, we can calculate our risks. So the risk of disease progression, given um, that somebody had a prior knee injury is 25% given that someone didn't have a prior knee injury is 12 and percent, and that gives us a risk ratio of two. Similarly, you could calculate the odds. So we get an odds ratio of 2.33. Um, the agreement or the accuracy is 75%, and the sensitivity is 33%, and the specificity is 82%. So to model this with a statistical model, we could use logistic regression. So this is a parametric generalized linear model that we use when we have a binary outcome. Um, we model the log of the odds of having the outcome as a function of our predictors or our covariates or our features, um, whatever you'd like to call them. This assumes um, a linear relationship between the log odds of the outcome and the covariates. And this is available sort of in any traditional standard software package, uh, Proc Logistic and SAS, the GLM function in R, the logic command in Stata. And we obtain an odds ratio by exponentiating the estimate for beta one. So if we go back to our um, previous example of the OA progression, if you were to kind of plug those data into one of these packages, you would get a regression equation where the log of the odds of OA progression is equal to negative 1.95 plus 0 0.847 times a previous knee injury. So by exponentiating that regression coefficient, we get our odds ratio of 2.33. Um, so uh, multivariable logistic regression, we'd be taking this one step further where we want to have more than one predictor. So again, the log odds of outcome is modeled as a function of our covariates. And here the odds ratio would quantify the adjusted association between each predictor and outcome. And the adjusted association means holding all other predictors constant. Let's say instead of a dichotomous predictor, we have a continuous one. So here's another example where we have the biomarker CTX2, which has been shown to be associated with OA progression. 
We have a box plot showing the distribution of our predictor CTX2 on the left in the light gray for those who don't have OA progression and on the right in the dark gray for those that do have OA progression. We can still use logistic regression to assess the um, association between predictor and outcome. So again, we're just modeling the log odds of outcome as a function of our covariate. And in this example, we get a regression equation where the log odds of progression is equal to negative 1.59 plus 0 0.5 times CTX2. Um, again, exponentiating that beta coefficient, we get an odds ratio of 1.7. Oops. Um, we interpret this odds ratio as the increase in odds of outcome associated with a one unit increase in our predictor. So this is what I meant when I said we assumed a linear relationship that each one unit increase in CTX2 is associated with the same 1.7 times increase odds of progression. And it doesn't matter sort of what comparison you're looking at, whether you're going from a value of negative two to negative one, or you're going from a value of one to two, that one unit increase in your predictor is associated with that same increase odds of outcome. Um, so here we can start thinking about whether this is really what we want to model, and if not, what else can we do? I think on the one hand, I mean, this is nice and straightforward. You get one odds ratio, 1.7, an increased risk of pro progression associated with CTX2. But on, on the other hand, if that's not really what's happening, if there's not a linear relationship between your predictor and outcome, then maybe this isn't all that useful after all. So say instead of assessing the linear relationship between increase in CTX2 and increase in odds of outcome, we wanted to ask, is there a cut point in CTX2 that best discriminates or classifies between progressors and non-progressors? So we could cut here and say that everybody sort of with a value above this line is gonna get classified as a progressor and everybody below it is gonna get uh, classified as a non-progressor. We could cut here. So where do we make the cut point and how do we kind of optimize this discrimination? Part of it depends on what the question is. Do we want to maximize the agreement or the accuracy? Do we want to maximize sensitivity? Do we want to maximize specificity? Or do we want to maximize some combination? Um, and I think this is important to think about here because it will come up later in some of these machine learning methods that when you're talking about kind of optimizing an algorithm to predict the outcome, um, what sort of what um, what is it that you actually want to to maximize in terms of your model fit? So again, if we're thinking about this kind of cut point analysis, you can do this pretty easily with a simple logistic regression model. Um, so you can do this with what's called an ROC curve, where we plot sensitivity versus one minus specificity for all possible cut points of our continuous variable. Um, so we could cut here where everybody above the line gets classified as having the outcome, everybody below the line gets classified as not having the outcome. That would correspond to this point in the ROC curve um, with a sort of low sensitivity of 26% and a high specificity of 88%. And you can kind of see how that works out when you look at the box plot. Um, Again, anyone above the line gets classified as having the outcome. So there's high specificity um, on the left where we aren't incorrectly identifying people without the outcome as having the outcome. But on the box on the right, um, we're missing a lot of cases. So there's low sensitivity. Um, we aren't correctly identifying very many cases. Instead, we could cut down here. So this would have the opposite, the low specificity and high sensitivity. So we're capturing most of the cases, but we're also incorrectly identifying a lot of the people that did not have progression. Or we can also do something where we maximize the combination of sensitivity and specificity. Um, this is also called Uden's J index, where you sort of say, I wanna weight sensitivity and specificity equally. And in this instance, it would be cutting here. Um, where we have a relatively high specificity of 82% and a sensitivity of 43%. So it's a trade-off um, in terms of what you want to maximize. And again, that gets back to kind of the question at hand. Um, so this starts to become more complicated if we have more than one predictor. So here we have an example where we have two biomarkers. We have CTX2 and MMP3, which have both been shown to be associated with OA progression. And we want to see how can we sort of combine these two to come up with the best um, prediction for OA progression. 
So we could go back to our CTX2 and create a cut point and say that, you know, everybody above this cut point, we're going to classify as having um, progression. And then for people to the left of the line, we want to cut further. We want to say, okay, now that we've set, sort of said everybody above this um, cut point for CTX2 is going to get classified as having a progressor, let's additionally make a cut for MMP3. Um, and say that everybody sort of above this line is going to get classified as a progressor and everybody below it will get uh, classified as a non-progressor. We could think about trying to draw some function um, of separating the progressors from the non-progressors. And so this is with only two predictors and you can see how this might get even more complicated as we move into a larger dimensional uh, parameter space. So this is how we start moving from a more traditional statistical modeling to kind of these non-parametric machine learning approaches. Again, if you think about this and how easy it is to interpret, um, you know, you could make these two cuts and pretty easily classify people and explain to people why somebody is being classified as a progressor or not progressor. Once you start getting to these sort of non-parametric functions, you might do a better job at predicting, but it's a lot harder to kind of quantify that relationship between your predictors and your outcome. So again, this is how we start moving from these more traditional statistical approaches to the machine learning approaches. And um, we'll come back to this example of creating cut points for predictors later. But I also wanted to talk about kind of another issue with traditional statistical approaches, um, which is sort of called feature selection basically figuring out what variables you want to include in your model. Um, so going back to logistic regression, where we're trying to predict a binary outcome, there's a, a rule of thumb where we want to have at least 10 outcomes for each predictor, or really for each degree of freedom. So for example, in our OA progression example, we had 250 progressors and 750 non-progressors which suggests a model where we could include, you know, 25 predictors or 25 degrees of freedom. So the questions are, you know, how do we choose the best combination of predictors? What if we have more than 25 predictors and we can't just sort of stick everything in the model? What if the number of predictors is greater than 1,000? Um, and I know many of you in the OA field are probably um, familiar with the Osteoarthritis Initiative, which is this uh, great resource, a publicly available database that must have, I mean, thousands, maybe tens of thousands of potential predictors. So how do you start to narrow that down? And the reason we're worried about this is because of overfitting. So we'd like the model to generalize to populations that were not included in our sample. If we put too many predictors in our model, um, the model starts to capture random variation in our data. So it'll fit really well to the data that we're using, but it won't generalize to data that aren't included in this sample. Um, so what are some ways that you can think about selecting variables to include in the model? Let's say these are thought of as sort of traditional statistical methods. Um, you would learn them in any kind of biostatistic logistic regression class. But this is as we sort of start to automate our, our model building. So what are some selection procedures? So um, backward selection. This is when you start with all predictors in the model and then you remove the predictor with the highest p-value and you continue until all p-values are less than your critical p-value. Forward selection is the opposite. So you start with the predictor with the lowest p-value that's also less than your critical value. Put that in the model and then you check each remaining predictor to find the adjusted p-value um, and add the predictor with the smallest p-value, continuing to do this until there are no more predictors that meet your threshold. Stepwise selection is a combination of the two. Um, so you start as in forward with adding predictors, but at each stage you also check to make sure that um, the original predictor is still greater than your critical value. Um, so you can do this with p-values as I described here, but you could also do this with other fit statistics like the AIC or the BIC or the adjusted R-square. So this is a way to, if you have a whole lot of predictors and aren't sure which ones to include in the model, um, to think about how you might start selecting them. Another way is uh, best subsets. So this is checking every possible subset of variables and then choosing the subset with the best fit, so based on some set criteria. So what are some concerns with these regression selection procedures? So for example, with the best subsets procedures, how many combinations are there to check? If you had five predictors, 
that's 31 subsets, that's pretty reasonable. But in our example with 25 predictors, that's 30 million subsets to check. That's, that's not really reasonable. And you know, 25 predictors really isn't all that many. Um, with backward selection, you can run into convergence issues. So again, you're starting with everything in the model um, and that can sometimes just, the model won't converge. There are issues with overfitting and sort of multiple testing. If you're using a p-value based approach to kind of continue to test and add and subtract things from the model, the question is, you know, are those p-values really meaningful? And these methods can also be very sensitive to the order that the variables are added. Um, so these can work well when um, you don't have a ton of predictors, when you have sort of a, a good sense of what you might want to include and you just want to refine your model. But in terms of that, that question where your number of predictors is greater than n, um, these really aren't going to work. So what are some other options? Um, so I'm not going to go through these methods in detail, but I just wanted to say that you, know, you can take these variable selection procedures one step further than the sort of traditional selection approaches and apply some more complex algorithms. So penalized regression is one way to do that. Um, these are also referred to, you might hear them as uh, shrinkage or regularization. And essentially, there's a penalty for complexity. So regression coefficients are shrunk towards zero to avoid overfitting, which can mean less variance, but potentially more bias. Um, the most popular penalized regression methods you may have heard of, um, probably the most popular one is lasso regression. And in this, the sum of the absolute values of the regression coefficients must be less than some constant. And so what's nice about this is it may force some of the coefficients um, estimated to be exactly zero. So lasso can work both as variable selection and in um, regression. And this typically performs better when you think there are just a few important predictors that you really want to identify. Um, ridge regression, instead of penalizing the absolute value of the regression coefficients, it penalizes the sum of the squares of the regression coefficients. Um, ridge regression, regression shrinks the coefficients towards zero, but will not set any of them exactly to zero. So it does include all of the predictors in the final model. This typically performs better when, you know, all of the predictors may be important. And then elastic net is just a combination of the two. So again, not to go through them in detail, but just to say, if you're starting to get to that point where those traditional statistical methods in terms of backwards or forward selection aren't working, then penalized regression might be a good next step. Um, so we're talking about kind of setting a penalty and how do we find this constant that we use to penalize complexity? And so this is often done in the setting of cross-validation. So just to quickly go through this, um, cross-validation is a resampling procedure to estimate how the model might perform out of sample. So what we do is we take our full data set, we split it into K random samples for K-fold cross-validation, um, this is often done in five or 10. So here we would have 10-fold cross-validation. We take our full data set, we split it into 10 samples. And then what we do is we train and develop the model on the first nine of these samples and we hold out the 10th subgroup. And then we test the model that we developed in that 90% of the data and this last 10% of the data. And we continue doing that for each um, sort of set of subgroups so that for each of the 10 subgroups, we end up with a predicted outcome um, where that prediction model did not use data from that subgroup. So in some ways, it's sort of an out of sample prediction. And then we put our data set back together, uh, our full data set with predicted values, whether that's a probability of outcome or some continuous measure. Um, and then with our full data set with out of sample predictions, we can do things like assess the performance of our model by calculating cross validated fit statistics. Uh, we can choose a penalty for penalized regression that minimizes residuals or sort of whatever other fit statistic that we use. Um, we can assess multiple models, choose the one with the best fit. And we'll come back to this point later, but we can also choose a weighted combination of models. Um, and this is really important to assess overfitting, especially when we do not have a validation sample. And so there's this idea of optimism, which is that our model is always going to perform better on data that it hasn't seen versus data that it or always perform better on the data that it was trained on versus data that it hasn't seen. And so cross validation is not only a way to sort of get at this optimism, um, but also a way to sort of do model building. 
So um, let's come back to our example of the two continuous predictors and how we're trying to find the um, optimal cut point to predict OA progression. So in essence, what we were doing before was creating a decision tree. So if we wanted to start by making our cut point in CTX2, um, we could cut here at around 0 0.1. And again, um, say that um, these, this side over here looks like they're more likely to have progression. Um, and then we would say, okay, out of everybody over here, what seems to be the best cut point in MMP3? And let's say it's negative 0 0.75. So everyone in this upper right section would get classified as having the outcome and everybody in this lower right section would get classified as not having the outcome. So similarly for those with CTX2 less than 0 0.1, we could also try to figure out where the best cut point is. And maybe it's up here in this upper left corner. So we might cut at say MMP3 around zero where everybody with a value greater than zero in that upper left corner gets classified as having the outcome and everybody in that lower left corner um, who has an MP3 less than zero would cl get classified as not having the outcome. And so this idea is uh, sort of the idea behind classification and regression trees. Um, this is what's called recursive partitioning. Um, so the data are partitioned into subsets and there is no regression equation. So this is a non-parametric approach. Every value of the predictor is considered as a potential split. So if you think back to that ROC curve where you could make the cut at different points, um, you do that here, but with multiple variables. And the optimal split is based on minimizing incorrect classifications. And so where we make the split is called the node. The terminal node is when we have no further splits and you can decide to stop splitting based on sort of any number of criteria, number of observations, lack of improvement, um, the tree depth. And then pruning is when we remove sections of the tree to avoid overfitting. So all of this tree building, where the splits are made, when we stop splitting, how much we prune back, are based on criteria that we specify at the beginning of the analysis. And so I wanted to walk through um, an example in the OA literature that was published last year, looking at the role of MRI in classifying individuals who will develop accelerated radiographic knee osteoarthritis. So in this example, the first split was made at a fusion volume. So those with a fusion volume greater than or equal to 14 were classified as having accelerated knee OA. And that was it, that was the first step. If you have a fusion volume greater than or equal to 14, you get classified as having accelerated NEOA. If your fusion volume is less than 14, then we check BML volume. And then if the BML volume is greater than or equal to 24, you get classified as not having accelerated NEOA. If the BML volume is less than 0 0.24, we go through cruciate ligament degeneration and a fusion volume. So what's nice about this approach is that it explicitly models the interaction between variables. And by interaction, we mean that the effect of variable B depends on the level of variable A. So in this example, the effect of BML depended on um, effusion. And the results are intuitive and clinically interpretable. There are clear rules. I mean, this diagram is really pretty straightforward to walk through. But there are some concerns with classification and regression trees. Um, it's a so-called greedy approach, which is prone to overfitting. Um, and what they, so what we sort of mean by that is that each decision is optimized to the data set under study at that node. So there's no looking back or no looking forward at any step or considering sort of combinations of variables. The method looked at effusion first, found that was the best cut point, and then moved on to BML volume. Um, it's highly dependent on the input data, so small changes can lead to different trees, and it's really especially dependent on the first split. Um, so there are methods that can address these concerns with classification and regression trees, but the penalty we pay is complexity, so we'll no longer have this kind of easy to digest flowchart. Um, so that brings us to these ensemble machine learning methods. Um, so the idea behind the ensemble machine learning methods is that we combine the information from multiple models to improve model performance. So we develop many predictor models and then we combine them to perform a, to form a composite predictor. 
And as part of this ensemble machine learning, um, we might do bagging, which is called boots, referred to as bootstrap aggregation. We draw a bootstrap sample from the data, we fit the model to this sample, and we repeat, and we average the predicted values across the bootstrap samples. And then boosting is a way to improve so-called weak learners. So this is a sequential technique where we focus each iteration on the incorrectly classified data points from the previous iteration. So this is just a schematic of what that might look like. In that first, first box there, we have our one iteration. So think back to that one classification and regression tree. With bagging, we would pull random samples and do a separate model for each of those random samples sort of in parallel and then summarize the results. Um, with boosting, we would take our data um, do our model, figure out sort of where it wasn't performing well, and then try to model that and do that kind of in a, a sequential way. And so if we think about trying to improve on our classification and regression tree, one way that we might think about that is with random forest. Um, so just as an example, this is another tree-based approach like CART, but it uses bagging. So we draw a random sample of subjects and a random sample of predictors and create our decision tree. And we do that many times and average across the trees. What's nice about this is the improved prediction and it's more stable. So by drawing random samples of subjects and random samples of predictors, we're not having that issue where sort of the, the regression tree is um, so influenced by per perhaps a couple of observations or by that first split. The con though, again, is interpretability. So um, we can use measures to assess variable importance, but there's no clear measure to assess the association between predictor and outcome. So there's no odds ratio or mean difference or something like that. And, and there's also no final tree. So what we've done is we built a whole bunch of trees and sort of averaged the prediction across them. So even that kind of nice diagram that we had in the card example, we don't really have anything like that. Um, so this is just a schematic of what the random forest might look like. We do our bagging to randomly select, select subjects and randomly select variables. Um, and then we get lots of different trees, which we combine together for our final prediction. And you can kind of see like, what I like about this schematic is that you can see that each tree is actually different. And so here's an example on how we might assess variable importance um, from a paper looking at two year incidents and predictors of future knee arthroplasty in people with osteoarthritis. And so there are two measures of variable importance along the axis and all of the variables that were assessed are in this figure. And so two variables that seem to be pretty important in terms of assessing the risk for future knee arthroplasty were advanced structural disease and the SF12 physical component. And then something that didn't seem as important was family history of knee replacement. So again, we're not getting that kind of, um, you know, having KL4 is associated with a three times increase odds of needing total knee arthroplasty, but you are able to kind of see which variables are sticking out as important in the prediction. And then finally, I just wanted to touch on the super learner. Um, this is an ensembling machine learning approach that combines multiple algorithms into a single algorithm. So the idea is that you run many algorithms and you use cross-validation to assess model performance. You combine the models weighting by the model performance and cross-validation. And this relies on stacking, which is the averaging across multiple different algorithms rather than bagging or boosting. And I don't have sort of time to go through this in detail, but I did want to point out that reference at the bottom um, from Sherry Rose in the American Journal of Epide Epidemiology, where she examined 12 models, including both random forest and lasso, um, and used a super learner to determine how each of these sort of model predictions should be weighted to come up with a final model prediction. And so this is a really flexible method that in some ways can take advantage of all of these different approaches. And then I just wanted to say um, a quick word about deep learning. So this is um, outside of my area of expertise, but we're seeing it kind of more and more in the literature. Um, with machine learning, you know, we train algorithms to learn from data and to make predictions. So we have our input, we extract our features, we do our classification, and we determine our outcome. 
Um, deep learning is a subfield of machine learning using artificial neural networks that seeks to both uncover feature and patterns and to make classifications. So you can see from that kind of bottom schematic that we input the data, we do feature extraction and classification, and we get our output. Um, so this paper was published last year looking at multimodal machine learning based knee osteoarthritis progression prediction. What was really neat about this paper is it used the um, directly uses the raw radiographic data to both figure out which features of the image are important and to predict outcome. So it doesn't rely on any sort of, um, you know, image grading or image quantification. It takes the raw image data, it figures out which pieces of it are important, and it also can do the prediction. Um, and then as a, a final note on statistical modeling versus machine learning. Um, so with statistical modeling, we think more about kind of drawing a population inference from a sample. Um, where in machine learning, we may think more about finding generalizable predictive patterns. Um, in statistical modeling, the overall prediction with an interpretable model is the goal, and this is when we might really need to understand the associations between variables and outcomes. And I really like this quote. Um, it was the Boston University Adrian Couples Award winner this year, um, Dr. Mukherjee, who's the chair of biostats at the University of Michigan, said not just to predict, but to understand. Where in machine learning, overall prediction is the goal, um, and we may not be able to succinctly describe the impact of any one variable, but you know, as we saw with that graph, it doesn't mean that we can't determine what variables are important. Um, it just means that that sort of quantifying the relationship between every variable and outcome is going to be a little bit more difficult. Statistical modeling works well with you know, low dimensions, uh, small sample size. You know, we really kind of need these machine learning methods when we have that high dimensional data Again, if you try to stick more predictors than you have um, subjects into your kind of regular logistic regression model, it's just not gonna work. <laughs> um, statistical modeling will give you a formal assessment of uncertainty, um, but machine learning gives you a lot of flexibility. Um, you can sort of model these many complex relationships between predictors and interactions and things like that. So I just wanted to point to a couple of references. Um, I think, you know, we think of machine learning as a relatively new field, um, but it's really not. Uh, this first reference, which is a really great text, The Elements of Statistical Learning, goes through pretty much everything that I talked about today. And it was, you know, first published in 2001. Um, I'd heard it, I would urge anyone considering prediction models to look at this last reference, the tripod statement, the transparent reporting of multivariable prediction model. Um, and again, kind of going back to that schematic we looked at the beginning about how you would build, train, and validate your model, really no matter what methods you're using, whether you're using linear regression or whether you're using um, a support vector machine, the statement outlines how and what should be reported to ensure transparency. Um, a couple more references and um, yes, thank you. It's a little bit strange to talk into my computer for 40 minutes. So <laughs> thanks so much. Thank you, Dr. Collins. So we do have time for a few questions if anybody has any. So just a reminder, you can type your question into the chat box or you can also unmute yourself to ask your question. And while everybody's thinking, I have a couple to get us started. So what are the software options for these methods? Can it be done in SATA or SAS? Yeah, that's um, a good question. So a lot of this can be done in SAS or SATA. Um, I believe both will do lasso, ridge regression, elastic net. I think those were actually pretty recently added to SATA. Um, SAS has started rolling out some machine learning capability in the last few years, and so I think you can do some of the ensembling methods like random forest and SAS, but these like sort of legacy software systems can be slow to add new modeling methods, and it's, it's just because they're doing a lot of testing and validation to make sure everything's sort of working. They're doing um, a lot of documentation. 
And so if you really want to get on like the cutting edge of new things that are out there, you've got to move to something like R. Um, and I think that's kind of the best way to take advantage of these methods while still being user friendly. Um, the classification and regression tree example and the random forest example that I walked through um, were both done using R. And then if you wanted to move on to more deep learning, I think that's um, Python or TensorFlow, or you start to get into um, some pretty advanced programming languages for those. Hey, this is Paul Neider. Can I ask a question? Sure. Hey, so this has been a, a very helpful. So I, <clears throat> I get a little confused, like when, when you're describing lasso and elastic net ridge regression, um, all, you know, I'm familiar with all of those, you know, those um, techniques, but where I get a little bogged down is in trying to um, decide when to, do I use them for the feature selection or do I use them in the actual construction of the prediction model? Um, um, and then, you know, and, and as well as the cross validation. So all that. So I guess, is there a good reference for, I mean, I don't want to say, you know, kind of like a, a recipe for building a good prediction model, but, you, you know, something that kind of distills it down to, you know, here's or, here are some techniques you should be using in the feature selection. You know, maybe it depends on your sample size. Um, and then when you're, you know, because because usually every time I read these papers, they, they kind of throw out all these techniques and I'm like, how do we actually combine them all to to do it in a way that's, you know, we're going to end up with a, a prediction model that people can trust? Yeah, that's a good, a good question. And I think um, the answer that statisticians love to give is that it depends. <laughs> um, but let me go back just to that slide. Oh, I have too much animation in here. Um, because I, I think one of the things, especially when we're talking about lasso ridge and elastic net, one of the ways that you can decide between those is, you know, whether you, you do want to do feature selection. So do you think that you have, you know, this whole set of variables, you're not sure, some of them might be important, some of them may not be. Um, let's see if we can figure out, you know, what's important and what's not, and then also look at the association between those predictors and outcomes. Um, that's when lasso, I think, would be kind of where you want to go because, again, it, it forces some of those coefficient estimates to be exactly equal to zero. Um, so it, it can work in kind of eliminating some of the predictors that don't seem to be contributing to your prediction. Um, rich regression would be more when you think everything might have it be a little bit important and you want to include everything in the final model. But again, I mean, I think with any kind of modeling decision, and I think this is why the, the sort of checklist, like the tripod checklists are so important, is that you might make a different decision than I would. You know, we could each have the same data set, and I might say, well, I don't think all of these variables are important. I want to eliminate some, so I'm going to use lasso. And you could look at the exact same data set and say, I think all of these are important, and I want to include all of them in my final model. I'm going to use ridge. So, you know, I think part of it comes down to how you interpret the data, what the data look like, what your question is um, in terms of determining exactly what you want to use. And so, in, yeah, I don't think there's sort of an easy answer for how you would choose one versus another. So we have a few questions coming in in the chat. Um, the first one is, Wondering if you'd be willing to share your slides with the group or if you would prefer it just to be the recording. Oh, sure. Yeah, I don't mind sharing them. I think um, they may already be. Well, I'll talk to council after, but I, I can make the slides available. Great. And then next question is software commands or packages to run. That's what was written. <laughs> oh, I'm oh. sorry. I miss I miss part of it. Okay. Are there concerns about the reproducibility of machine learning models? Do you get the same answers if you subject the same data set to these ML approaches? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think with any, with, with any statistical model, there are probably concerns about reproducibility. What we're trying to do with the machine some of the machine learning approaches in terms of that cross-validation, bagging, boosting, 
is trying to sort of sample from our data to avoid overfitting, because I think that's kind of the concern with some of these algorithms. Again, that ridge regression is gonna include everything in the final model. The regression coefficients will be shrunk, um, but you do start to worry about overfitting. And so I think that's where it's really important to think about um, how we're doing these resampling procedures to make sure or to kind of protect against that overfitting. And again, we go back to that example of the um, classification and regression trees. Let me just um, see if I can find the slide. Um, that's somewhere where you really do worry about, um, or, or simulation studies have shown that it can be really um, sensitive to a couple of outliers in the data. It can be really sensitive to where you make that first cut. Um, so I think just making sure that you, you sort of understand um, kind of the pros and cons of every method. Um, I do think something like random forest where you are randomly sampling subjects, you're randomly sampling predictors, that's probably, I would guess, likely to be more reproducible. But again, then you, you start, and somebody asked a question about sort of the black box, then you start to get into this black box. Um, so, so yeah, so I, I do think that the methods, that a lot of these machine learning methods really do focus on that kind of out of sample prediction for exactly this reason that because they're so complex, they can be prone to overfitting. Um, and then I'll just, I guess, from there, this is a pretty straightforward um, transition to, um, can you briefly, briefly discuss the notion of the black box and um, that some of these methods provide? And I think one of the criticisms of um, kind of machine learning has been this black box. And as I tried to emphasize, you know, throughout the talk is that as we use some of these methods to improve prediction, we kind of lose that link between our predictors and outcomes. So again, you don't necessarily have that, um, that quanti quantification of for every one unit increase in this, my risk of having the outcome goes up by that. And I think, I think sometimes that's okay, and maybe sometimes it's not so okay. So if we maybe go back to, um, the random forest example. Here, um, you know, I think with any statistical modeling problem, the question, and this is, this is again something statisticians love to say, the question is, what is the question? Um, you know, if we go back to this example from Dan Riddle's group, they were able to rank the predictors in terms of importance. So with this random forest, there is no kind of quantification of, well, how much does that advanced structural disease affect your risk of having future knee arthroplasty? Um, so that is a bit of a black box, but, but we do know that advanced structural disease is important. I think it's, it's really kind of what the research question is. So in this instance, um, you know, if we are, um, I guess sort of if a patient is coming into a clinician's office and they want to know kind of their risk of needing a knee replacement in the next 10 years, does it matter to them if their risk is coming from having advanced structural disease progression or having a previous knee injury or having a family member that had a knee replacement or do they, they just want to know what the risk is? Um, on the other hand, if you had a study where you were trying to look at some sort of modifiable risk factor, so um, many of you are probably familiar with um, Steve Messier's IDEA trial that looked at um, diet and exercise to see if that could um, affect, um, I don't remember if it was OA incidence or progression, but there is, it's really important to quantify the relationship between you know, weight loss and outcome. We want to know if somebody loses 10 pounds or 20 pounds or 30 pounds, how does that affect their future risk of developing OA or needing a knee replacement or what have you? So again, I think it depends on the question. In some instances, I think the, the black box approach probably isn't, is, is probably okay because we don't, we don't really need to know exactly what those relationships are. Um, but if you're thinking about 
can we come up with some sort of modifiable risk factor to help um, prevent OA progression or prevent OA incidents, then yeah, I, don't, I think the black box is a big problem. Great, another question is, are there recommendations in terms of sample size for different machine learning methods such as CART, Random Forest, et cetera? Um, you know, I have to say I'm not totally sure. Um, that's, a, that's a really good question. I do think kind of going back to the previous question about reproducibility, um, that you would worry a little bit less about sample size when you're doing these methods that do either resampling or cross-validation because um, you're a little bit you're you know you're worried a little bit less about overfitting um, but I, yeah, I'd have to look into that I'm not sure if there are sort of like logistic regression with that rule of thumb of, of 10 events per variable um, I'd yeah I'd have to think about that a little bit more okay and another question is where does BART, I don't know if they maybe meant CART, stand in your family of methods? Um, yeah, that's, that's a good question. I'm not um, super familiar with BART. I think it is BART. It's um, Bayesian Additive Regression Trees, which I, I actually haven't worked with so much. So um, I'm not, I'm, 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 again, that's one I'm not totally sure about. But I mean, I think this just sort of speaks to the plethora of methods that are out there. I mean, there are so many different methods and um, going back to that question of, you know, how, how do you figure out which one is right for your data, I think is, um, again, I think not, there's not really a clear answer. And I like to think about, many of you have probably seen in sort of like an intro stats class, you know, if you have a continuous outcome and a binary predictor, you should use a t-test. If you have a continuous outcome and a multi-level predictor, use ANOVA. And you have this sort of nice little flowchart that tells you what tests to use depending on the distribution of your outcome and the distribution of your predictor. Um, and I think when you start getting into some of these more complex methods, it's a lot more nuanced than that. So. Um, I think what concern that people have is just um, sort of when someone kind of blindly applies a method to a problem and really having to think about why you would use a certain method, what are the pros and cons, um, and yeah, sort of thinking through how, how that method matches your question, like a little bit like we talked about for lasso versus ridge regression. So. Um, anyway, I don't, I don't think that there's an easy answer, but yeah, there, there's a lot more out there than kind of what we talked about today, even just in this great example. And I would point everybody to this paper um, from Sherry Rose. I think it won the American Journal of Epidemiology's like best paper award in 2017. Um, but she used, I think, 12 different um, machine learning algorithms in this super learner. So there's there's a lot out there and then why did she pick these 12 in particular you know I'm not not sure but anyway it gets it gets complicated pretty quickly <laughs> well, I don't see any other questions in the chat um, so we can go on and wrap up feel free if wow oh it looks like there's one more okay so the random forest figure is a nice diagram to help understand the importance of a single feature I've never seen anyone run a set of more standard statistical models with the aim of obtaining more interpretation with the outcome being a ML solution. It would seem this would be possible if we used ML outcomes. Have you seen any efforts to improve understanding of the outcome? Yeah, um, not, so one of the things that, that some people have suggested would be to use, um, one of these machine learning approaches, so like a random forest, and um, develop your, developing your prediction model that way, and then going back and choosing um, the variables that's, that were most important. And again, there are a number of different ways to sort of rank variable importance, but if you really wanted to get a sense of um, what those associations were between your covariates and your outcome, 
what you could do is, is, I mean, a priori, you would want to say exactly how are you going to do this, but I'm going to choose all of the variables that are, you know, meet some threshold for variable importance. And then at the end, kind of run a logistic regression model, including those variables. And so at least you could get some sense even of the direction of the associations. I think, you know, the predictions that you're going to get from that logistic regression model are not going to be the same as the predictions that you get from your machine learning model. But that's one way to, to try to get around this a little bit and say, um, can we at least get a sense of how these variables are kind of acting? Um, so I, I have seen people do that. I'm not sure if that's what exactly what the question was. Okay. So just to wrap up, can Jamie provide a link where we can find her work and papers on these topics? Um, I can, I'll make the slides available and I just, I think would encourage you to check um, the references. Um, going back to these, um, there are some textbooks here, but I try to include um, a couple of more clinical papers. Again, this one um, that was in Nature's Review, Nature Review's Rheumatology last year on machine learning based patient specific prediction models for knee osteoarthritis was a really nice overview and I think would be a really good place to start. And the same with that paper um, from Dr. Rose. Um, or this is a different paper. She's published a lot <laughs> in this area, but those are ones that kind of walk through um, some of this at a high level and would, I think, provide some direction on, on where to go next. Great. Okay, well, I'd like to say thank you again, Dr. Collins, for taking the time to talk with all of us today. I'll be sending a follow-up email to everyone in the coming days with a link to access the recording and then also with the PowerPoint information. Um, that way you're able to look at the PowerPoint or listen to the talk again, and you can also share everything with your colleagues. Thank you again, everyone, for attending the talk. If you have any questions, I just put my contact information in the chat. So questions or if you'd like to be on the listserv about future presentations, feel free to shoot me an email or send me a private chat. And I'd like to say thank you again to everybody and Dr. Collins. Have a great day, everyone. Great. Thank you, everyone. Bye. And great job, for the, especially for the first uh, inaugural presentation. I thought you did a great job. Yeah.